Hi there. My name's Tommy Yanolis, and I am the host of the brand new podcast, Empire Builders, Scaling Success One Location at a Time. This is a podcast dedicated to talking to the founders and the current leadership of those large multi-location brands that you see every single day where you eat and shop at. And we wanna find out from these guys, why this business, right? Why of all the things you could do in the world, you chose to do this. We're gonna learn what their challenges were at the beginning, what almost broke them. We're gonna learn what they're facing today. And as always, we're gonna end the show with a wonderful war story. That's one of those stories where you go, I can't believe we got through this. It was insanity, you know, and hopefully they always end with a nice little laugh. So I can't tell you how excited I am to bring you these interviews with these amazing guests and just stoke that entrepreneurial flame that we all have to learn what it took to kind of get where they are today and how they got successful. So thank you for joining us. And I look forward to sharing these wonderful interviews with you. Hey there, everybody. It's Tommy. I'm back with another episode of Empire Builders. Please welcome to the show, Isaac Aldridge. Isaac, how you doing, man? Doing great. How are you doing today, Tommy? I'm um, living the dream. Every day gets better and better. Actually, as I just was telling you, my kids went back to school. So the house is now mine again during the day. And I could not be happier. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah, it's a good feeling. Oh, it's wonderful. I can, uh, I can just be myself again. Um, anyway, welcome to the show. Uh, first question is my favorite question. So let's just jump into it. Tell me about like what's your position today and what is the name of your company? And so... Right now, I am a franchisee with Dirty Dough Cookies. And so we do stuffed gourmet soft baked cookies. If you look at the website, we do, uh, you know, we do just really, really good cookies. We do milkshakes with them. We blend them up into the shakes. Um, it's just kind of a delicious experience. So it's pretty fun. It's a fun, fun job. <laughs> nice. And then, so you're, how many stores do you operate today? So I only operate one. This is my first one. Um, we're definitely looking at expansion, but we're getting our flagship store just, you know, right where it should be so that it's a good example for any other locations we open up. And, uh, yeah, but we'll probably do more in the future. Did you, when you purchased your first franchise agreement, did you end up buying multiples or are you going to buy them later? So we bought one, uh, the, the way dirty dough does it is pretty cool though. I, I haven't done other franchises, so maybe this is standard, but the way they do it, you buy one, you can buy an area and you get a discount up front, but I still get a discount for any future uh, franchise fees that I do. So if I buy a food truck, if I buy another brick and mortar store, I get a little bit of a discount off of those, even though I didn't do it up front. You know, here's what I always tell people is they will sell you a franchise. They're mm -hmm. not like, so it, any kind of discount that they're talking about, it's almost like a gym membership, right? They're just trying to get as much money out of you at the beginning, but at the end of the day, they never are full of gym memberships. If they will find room for you or someone will move on. So right. like, I always tell people do one, just exactly what you're doing. Do one, get it going, figure out all your systems because the hardest jump in any business is one to two, right? Mm -hmm. That's true in coding because I'm in tech. That's true in coding. That's true in managing a business because right now you're there. You see everything that's happening. As soon as you go to two, all of a sudden you're not there in one of the stores. So now right. you have to learn how to actually manage and delegate and train. And so it's better to do all of that with one store where you can maintain your cash flow. So if things are getting crazy, you don't like end up, you know, losing the whole thing. So I think that's a great idea. Oh, for sure. For sure. Um, what did you do before Dirty Dough? So I've, I've jumped around a little bit, um, but I've been in accounting for the past five years. Um, you know, I, I studied business. I got my MBA and I always wanted to be a business owner, but I just kept, you know, just kept going. Ah, I need stability. You know, I got married. I had a kid. I had my second kid. Um, but just owning a business just kept calling to me. And so uh, eventually I was like, yeah, I, I got to get out and go go do something that matters. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's funny. I have an MBA. I have a wife. I have two kids. And I said, we don't need stability. I don't need stability. And I started this company 10 years ago. And my wife's like a financial advisor and super can like, 
she she needs stability and i just said yeah we don't need to worry about your needs we'll just do mine instead <laughs> <laughs> that's definitely a way to do it <laughs> not not the smart way to go let me tell you um yeah don't don't follow that advice of mine or learn from my mistakes people go get the corporate job when you have young kids anyway uh <laughs> Cool. So why Dirty Dough then? Let's go to question number two. If you could have chose any franchise in the world, why would you choose Dirty Dough? So Dirty Dough is really cool for a couple of reasons. And um, <clears throat> well, first one is I like the product. I mean, so I was living out in Utah with my wife and our first kid. And uh, we saw everything go down with just all the different cookie companies. There's some weird drama out there. I don't know if you followed that. Crumble cookies, having like some AUV yeah. issues. And all that stuff. And so we tried all of them and we just liked Dirty Dough the most. And so we were already fans. And then when I got to the point where I, I went and talked to my wife after being in accounting for a few years, I was like, I really want to go do something for me. You know, just, just a business that I can own, I can operate, we can do, um, you know, be masters of our own destiny. And uh, I just, I saw an ad for becoming a Dirty Dough franchisee. And it was like, um, Bennett Maxwell, the owner, talking about um, lowering the barrier of entry. So, I mean, it's a, it was a little bit cheaper than other franchises. Um, sure. It was new. Um, at the time, there were only like, there were like 15 of them or something when I signed up. And now there's like 60 in operation, another like 100 or 200 that are sold waiting to be built. And so we caught the wave really early. I was like, this is cool. Like we can get in on a new company. We know we like the product. And then I started looking into the business model too if you're familiar with it a little bit, so they make all the cookies in their facility and ship it to us frozen. Yeah. So all we do in the store is okay. bake them, we top them, we sell them. And so it is so simple from an operational standpoint for a food franchise. Yeah. I mean, we're not messing with meat. We're not making pizzas in the back. We're, we're not doing it. We don't need a master baker. Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah. So it's just streamlined. So business model was good. Product was good. It just kind of checked all the boxes I was looking for. It's really cool. Well, yeah. And I mean, like, I, I think like people underestimate simplicity in, in that kind of stuff. Like I, I had another guy on the show a couple of weeks ago. He's a Baskin Robbins franchisee and he has, his parents had one store for, you know, 30 years and now he's kind of taking it over and he's got nine, you know? And it's like, it's kind of the same deal like they they have so little cooking and prep which that and you go well well that's nice because it must be easier for you but no it's nice because you don't have to train as much you don't need as many employees you don't need as a big a space you don't need you know you don't have to have 500 different things you don't have to worry about perishability because literally everything's frozen so all you're doing is thawing these things and baking them when you need them you know so then you don't have as much waste so yeah, maybe the cookie puck costs more than it would if you made the dough yourself, but then you don't have to deal with the eggs and the flour and the giant Hobart mixer. You know, like it's just, it oh, seems yeah. like such an easy peasy thing. Let me ask you this. Does Dirty Dough like give you the ability to like open up a Dirty Dough kiosk like, at the mall and then make all your cookies at your store and bring them to the mall? Is that something you could do? Like are those the kinds of like opportunities, non trad stores available? So that's not set up that way already, but I will say what they, what they can do. So for instance, there's a food truck version that we can do. Yeah. You can use the brick and mortar as your commissary, kind of what you were describing. Yeah. So you can store all the pucks there and then you take them, you know, what, what fits on the truck for the day. You take your trailer out and you just, uh, you know, you can go to an event, you can sell cookies all day long and then you don't have anything stored anywhere, but at your store, you know, you just make sure you have a little extra storage so we can operate as a commissary. And so you can do the brick and mortar, you can do the food truck. What's cool is we're also one of, not the very first, but one of the very first Dirty Dose with the drive through um, I think there's like five of them. That's so awesome. That's going to be fun. We we are in the soft open right now. And so we'll have the drive through operational probably in like two or three weeks. And uh, then we're going to do our grand opening and, and do a lot of press for that. But yeah, the drive through is... Um, yeah, the drive-thru is going to be exciting. So there, there are some options. It is kind of a flexible thing. And what's nice is we are growing, but we're still early enough that they're taking a lot of suggestions. As I, you know, when I talk to them, I say, hey, can we do it like this? You know, sometimes they have to say no, but a lot of times they're like, hey, let's try it. You know, we've never done that before. <laughs> so nice. it's pretty cool to be be in it a little bit earlier on, you know, before we're, before we're a thousand locations across the country or something, you know? Yeah. And, and the real, yeah. And cause 
I worked at corporate restaurant when that was happening. And, you know, once you get that big, a lot of times they just say no because they don't want to have to do it for everybody else, you know? So a lot of times you'll get squashed, not because it's not a good idea, but because they don't want to deal with it across and manage it across 5,000 locations. So they'll just be like, nah, it's just easier to say no. Yeah. Yeah. And we actually toyed with a location at the mall here in Springfield. We didn't end up doing it, but um, the lease was pretty high and, you know, yeah. we wasn't quite sure if it'd be worth it for, for a product that hasn't been in Springfield before, you know, but you know, I, I think it definitely could be done in a mall. There, there's lots of places you can put a dirty dough. I, I like the idea. We were at a soccer tournament, like on Memorial day weekend in Albuquerque and there were some guys and they came up in a cookie truck and they just parked at the soccer tournament both days. They were there all day, like, you know, 12 hours a day. And then they were doing the soccer tournament during the day. And then they were going to head off to like a carnival or some fair or something later in the evening, you know, mm -hmm. but like the nice thing about that food truck is you can take the cookies to the people. Right. And like, it's like Kona ice. You go to any soccer tournament and there's always a Kona ice truck. And then your kids instantly want Kona ice. And you're like, shut up. You're all mad at the Kona ice guy. <laughs> but like at the same time, like I, it's a perfect business model because they get, you know, fifty percent of those kids. You know, yeah. either you lost the game and you feel bad for your kids, so you buy them a cone of ice, or your kid won the game and they're like, "Can I have cone of ice?" And you're like, "You scored a goal, have a cone of ice." You know, and it's like genius. That's cool. That's cool. Well, and I, you know, it also just from a sales perspective creates that urgency and that demand. You know, it's like you're taking you're taking ice to people where they're hot. You know, it's yeah. like. And then yeah. keep these, you, you take them to where people are hungry, you know, you go to a concert or a music festival or something, it's kind of perfect. People are moving around and whatever. And yeah, yeah. I mean, you could have that truck out 18 hours a day. You could be in the bar area at night. You could be, yeah. you know, at the kids event during the day. You could be doing a wedding, you know, in the afternoon. It's like crazy. Yeah. Well, and Dirty Dough kind of fits everybody. I mean, we, you know, we obviously have our target demographics, but at the same time, it's like, who doesn't, who doesn't like a big fat cookie, right? Like, yeah, yeah. Exactly. no doubt. So, okay. So you're just opening this first store right now. So yeah. what are some of the challenges that you've been facing getting this thing open? So I was listening to, uh, you, you know, your question and I'm just thinking there's the stuff that we're facing now that we're open and there's the stuff that came up during construction. And that's kind of the two main categories, but construction is a long road for us. Um, just because we had some difficulties acquiring a space, you know, we, we had a space beginning of last year and it didn't work out. We had to switch when we were already kind of, we're, we're already starting initial bids with contractors and stuff. And there's an issue sure. with Lord, we had to move. And then the actual construction, honestly, the, the tricky part was just that I don't really come from a construction background. You know, my dad did construction and that's about all the exposure I ever had to it. And so it's interesting because coming from an accounting background, I just had to learn like, all this lingo and different stuff. You know, I'm doing the real estate negotiation for a month. And then at the end of that, we finally sign a lease and we're doing the contractor stuff. And, uh, you know, we get most of the way through construction and they're like, who's your data guy? And I'm like, what do you mean my data guy? They're like, you gotta have someone come and put the data lines. We didn't do that. I was like, oh, okay. I thought that was you guys. All right. <laughs> you know, just yeah. all these little parts that I'm like, all right, I gotta figure that out now. <laughs> so that was, that was kind of the construction thing. It's just a totally new world to me. And then operating, it's like, um, you know, everything I learned in business school coming together and, and actually, you know, actually doing it hands on. Um, and, and I guess the biggest part with that is you can never account for the people aspect. You know, that's, that's kind of the tricky part because I can look at numbers all day from, you know, our sales the first week and go, oh, we can cut cost here and increase sales by marketing like this. But um, I think that human aspect is really the thing that's that you can't learn it till you learn it. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, definitely, definitely handling people is, is the thing that has been tricky here at the beginning, but we're, we're definitely, we have a good staff, so we're really happy with it. Yeah. I ran restaurants for, I should say I managed in restaurants for years. I mean, I started in the restaurant business when I was 14, but, um, my biggest piece of advice to you would be just make sure you're saying thank you and making these people feel appreciated. Mm more than anything else if you're you're not, not yelling at anybody and you just make people feel appreciated you say thank you it's their birthday you let them take a dozen cookies home or something like that whatever it is they will stay forever 
because they don't want to leave, but they leave because of bad managers, right? Mm. Like that's why people leave. They leave for bad managers. It's bad managers first, and then it's money is how they justify it, right? So I can go get a quarter across the street more an hour, which I mean, if you know you're making fifteen an hour, that's actually like a decent raise. You know, like you go, okay, well. But they won't. People are also lazy by nature too, so like they don't want to leave. But if you're a jerk manager, then they will just go and find another job that pays more. You know? Absolutely. And, and the restaurant industry is full of people. The guy literally fired people before, and then they walked. Like we were in a mall, and they walked across the hallway in the mall from our PF Changs to a legal seafood, and they went and got a job at legal seafood. Like then that I mean they literally were. I fired them. They walked across the hallway got an application and then within like a day i saw him working at the other place and i'm like okay you know and that's the whole industry is like that right so you know we always looking for people it's crazy right right for sure yeah um okay so that was sort of what you were challenged with the construction stuff now you're dealing with the staffing stuff what who's working there you got uh do you got like high school kids or do you have your you know are you working there yourself obviously i would assume and so the way we're doing it um we tried so here here's kind of my uh my war story i think you were asking about that earlier right yeah <laughs> so what's going on is uh you know when we first were about to open um we had a manager that we were going to hire and we had difficulties with her before we even got her into the store which is um, a bad sign yeah i started seeing red flags you know she uh no communication wouldn't show up when we needed to meet late to think late to meetings when we were going to discuss the store and and then um just started you know telling me about weird personal issues that didn't relate and i was like okay you're going to bring some stuff into the work yeah um so you know we we had to not go with her find a new manager and we did have a new manager who who was doing a good job but um just with sales with a new business i think we overestimated what we can afford uh, for yeah. the first month or two and we we're like this is not going to be sustainable budget wise and so um the way we moved it around my wife is managing um and i'm handling more of the accounting and the marketing and all the all the outside the store store stuff sure um, but my wife managed a cold stone creamer for a while before this and so she she's versed in these things and she also is really good at the details and the operational more than i am i'm better at the big picture and so we talked about it and she was like yeah i'd love to go manage the store i was like really okay cool <laughs> and so but i think that that's been the big thing is just that we've changed management twice already um and, and that's that's been difficult because like it anytime there's management change there's um you know yeah. other things you have to adjust uh, you have to go if there was a process they were doing a different way than you would do it you have to change processes um we haven't the second time that we've changed we actually haven't had any turnover so far which is kind of amazing um because i feel like anytime there's management change there's usually turnover but you know we'll see hopefully there's no no more changes though that's our plan is to keep it keep it steady but yeah, it's just, it's just been that, that people aspect of, um, you know, you have to make sure that you're getting quality employees, but then you have to balance that against what you can afford. I mean, we went back and forth. We were like, do we need to, you know, do we need to, cause payroll's obviously the, the biggest item you can control. So yeah. we're like, well, we don't want to let anybody go, but we also kind of have to. So we had to let our manager go, but then it was like, but now we we don't want to cut anybody's pay obviously we don't want to do that but you have to be able to afford to keep paying people and so it's um yeah it's it's been a kind of a wild ride already we've been open since june 18th um and so it's just yeah it's been a lot but we're we're figuring it out now with my wife in the store it's good because i have a much more i have a much closer ear to the ground you know what i mean yeah. um you know if something goes wrong in the store it's not like I have to go talk to my manager and go have a meeting with her. You know, my wife texts me and she goes, Hey, did you know we were doing this? I didn't know we were doing that. Should we change it? And it's fixed within 30 minutes, you know? And sure. so I think that's been our big thing is we're just trying to steady things out and make sure the processes are exactly how we want them. Because yeah, like, like you were asking who's working in the store. So my wife's working there and then most of our staff are between, so our youngest is 16. And our oldest is 26, I want to say, 26. Sure. And so it's definitely in that age range. And so we're, we're kind of 
figuring out, you know, how do we how do we make sure we're getting high quality, but you know, we can't pay everybody forty thousand a year, you know? And so yeah. it's like just that balance. And so yeah, so it was kind of a roundabout way to answer your question, but uh yeah. No, it's totally it's totally valid. It, yeah, I, I you know, I would have if you had asked me for my advice like six months ago, I would have said you should be running the store at the beginning just so you can figure it all out. Plus, you need that cash flow, right? Because right. like you said, you know, even with the even if you were doing ten thousand hours of, of local store marketing a week, this is a tough time, right? And mm -hmm. those cookies are probably three or four bucks a cookie. And so you know, you just gotta kind of balance everything out, right? Like you gotta go, okay. But yeah, but that's but that's the real world, right? That's what you're actually dealing with. And you, you took the right steps because you could, you know, the guy that I met the uh, I interviewed that is the Baskin Robbins, when they bought his parents' store, he ran that thing open to close for like three years straight while they were just getting it squared away because they were paying off his parents and you know what I mean? Like it was just a yeah. lot of money going out the door. So he was there, you know, seven days a week running that store essentially. For sure. And at least you're lucky enough that you have time to do the LS, the local store marketing and focus on the accounting and the books and all that other stuff. Cause your wife can be in the store actually making the cookies. Right. Yeah, definitely. That, that's been like the biggest thing for all of my entrepreneurial journey up to this point is just having a really good wife. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> a lot of headache. <laughs> oh, it, yeah, I mean, I, you know, owning your own business is like the greatest thing ever. And it is also the most stressful, miserable thing ever. And it, 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 you know, it's just, it's such, you know, it's like if you're in the corporate world, if you meet somebody and they make $300,000 a year, I guarantee you they travel for work. You know what I mean? They're on the road doing something. And, and so that's the miserable part of their job. They make a ton of cash, but then they, they're like, they have something's messed up. They got create like they're a doctor and they got crazy hours or, you know, they're always on call, whatever. It's like, there's no free ride. Like, like you can have the most least stressful job in the world, but that job's not going to pay what the good job pays. Right. Right. And like the problem with business ownership is that you, you feel like you have all this freedom, but you really don't. Like everyone thinks you have all this freedom, but you really don't because you've got this responsibility that like the other guy who just works at a business doesn't have. Right. 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 Yeah. It's interesting. Cause yeah, you, I think that was a big thing for me is the draw of like the freedom of it. And I think yeah. it's, it's, you have to think about what kind of freedom do you want? Yeah. Do you want the freedom to make as much money as possible? Like you, you just care about the number. Well then, yeah, you know, you can just go into sales and just get crazy commission and you know, you can, you'll make a lot of money. But yeah. Then, um, yeah, my my kind of freedom is, you know, I get to decide how I solve my problems. I get to decide, you know, that that creative freedom, but I'm still analytical. You know, I don't, yeah. I don't want to be a, a painter. You know, I don't need that kind of creative freedom, but I need yeah. to solve my problems my way and, and be able to master my destiny. That's that's what makes me want to be an entrepreneur. And sure. so it's what kind of freedom do you want is kind of the yeah. way I think about it. <laughs> and realistically like for small business ownership if you're not like somebody who wanted to come up with the cookie recipes right which i mean that that's like a very niche thing but franchising is one of the most powerful ways to build wealth quickly mm -hmm. because if you can get over the hump in this first store and figure out and learn all your lessons in the first year or two you know i was talking about a franchise salesperson recently and they're like you should try to have three locations in three years like if you could do that pace then mm -hmm. you will be at a point where you're making enough money to be good as the owner and you will have gotten over the two one to two hump right and you'll be doing good and then also there's always the risk of road construction or some weirdo event that can take out one single store so if you have a couple stores that are geographically diverse you can hopefully survive you know yeah. stupid, like you know whatever but i thought that was a really interesting pace but that that pace is only achievable if you get the first store up and running really, really well, right? Uh, quickly. Right. Yeah, that's kind of what our approach has been up to this point. We're just—I know we're early on, but we're we're already thinking ahead. Like, yeah, we just need to know. We want our processes to be so simple and so straightforward yeah. that you know, if we have an eighteen-year-old, 
girl in our store that wants to be manager that we could put her as manager and it wouldn't be unrealistic for her to be able to manage a store you know yeah. that that's, we want it simple enough that a high school student a young college student could run our store as manager and succeed yeah. um we don't want it to be something where you need a, a degree in business to understand how to operate it you know it's like yeah. we, you, you just shouldn't have to do that for a little cookie store and so if we can get it that simple then it'll be, um, you know, it'll just be a, a question of cash at that point of how quickly yeah. can we put more stores or do food trucks or whatever we want to do. So that, that process. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, well, cool, man. So you kind of already gave me your war story. Uh, do you have another war story you want to tell me? <laughs> <laughs> uh, let me think probably, I mean, I could go a little bit more in depth on, um, just, the losing the first location. Cause that was rough. That was, yeah. Let's talk about that because I've had I've heard that a lot recently. Yeah, um, from other people or about yeah, from my, other people yeah, that um, just they had their franchise agreement and it took them over two years to get a location and to and get it built out. You know, yeah, yeah and mine. Too, so I started the whole process of I got an investing partner and we we decided we were going to do this February of last year. I think we signed the franchise agreement in March or April, something like that. And then we had a location with a lease signed in July, I want to say. We were ready to go. We we're getting bids from contractors. We were getting good prices and everything. And uh, what happened was we we're going in next door to another cookie store. And so it was, oh. a, it was a bold move. Um, but I thought, you know what? Um, there's no better place to be than close to your competitor. So... What I did is I talked to the landlord, I double checked. They said there was no exclusivity clause whatsoever. They, we were allowed to be in the same building. And I was like, what about next door? Is that, you know, obviously they're not gonna like it, but it's an aggressive business move that I, I think could benefit us both in the long run. You know, both of our marketing brings in cookie customers. And um, so we were looking at doing that and the landlord said, yeah, it's totally fine. There's no clause, we're good. Um, we double checked everything. You're good. Move on in. And so we signed the lease. We paid the deposit. We paid the rent, everything. And um, as soon as we put up coming soon signs, we our landlord called us. They said, yeah, corporate. So the other cookie store's corporate office called us and they're furious. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, well, yeah, but you said we're good, right? <laughs> and yeah. they, were like, they were like, well, we misread your lease or we, we misread their lease. And so there was an exclusivity clause. It was just a clerical error that they thought there wasn't. And so I would, I would have been amazed if there wasn't, because usually you get something that says you can be the only sure. pretzel vendor in a trip center or whatever, right? For sure. And so I, I had asked them repeatedly before signing. I was like, I want to yeah. be sure, like, we're allowed to do this, right? Because I know they're not going to like it, but it's okay, right? Yeah. And they, and they were like, yeah, no, there's no problem. And then, uh, you know two weeks into the lease. They're like, yeah, nope, never mind. Your lease is null and void. You got to go. And so <laughs> that kind of stunk. And um, yeah, so we, we had to pull out, they made it right as best they could. So they, they actually um, paid us back for a lot of our expenses as we were going into the building. Um, and they, they tried, they apologized profusely and uh, tried to make it right to us. But it definitely cost us a lot of time. So the location we're in now, um, it took us probably a month and a half to find it. And then we started negotiating. The problem was the building was still under construction. Sure. And so it was a new building. So we had to wait for them to finish, you know, the, the main building, the framing and everything. And then we, um, and then we were able to start infill on our space. And so, uh, yeah, we, we just, we lost a ton of time was the main thing. Um, but had you quit your job as an accountant at that point. So I quit when we moved. So that was the other part. I don't know if I mentioned that we moved from Utah to Missouri for this. Oh, and so we were, we were like on a tight time constraint. We were like, all right. So I left my job. We moved to Missouri. We we're living on savings and stuff. And, uh, we we're, we we're like, all right, let's, you know, get this done, get it open. And then it took a year longer than expected to get open. So yep. I actually went and got another day job in between because I was like, well, we just, you know, got to stay don't, don't burn all your cash and stuff. But what really what really was crazy. So we lost that space. We got that phone call um, a week and a half before we had our second kid. 
and she came she came like three weeks early so we weren't expecting it so we lost the space two weeks later we're in the hospital and we're having a baby yeah <laughs> brought home our little girl i still didn't have my new day job at this point so i'm just like what are we gonna do yeah, this <laughs> you is know? it was crazy but then um by the end of that year we had a signed lease and we were doing infill and we were getting everything ready and then uh yeah, we just so we got open by June of this year um, when we signed we signed the lease in like I think it was December or January that we that we actually started the infill and then we had to do all the infill to get construction done and then we needed to um, you know wait for corporate approval to open and all that stuff and yeah so yeah I went from from like August of twenty three to uh june of 24 is was that wait period so that that was probably the hardest part <laughs> do, do you my and you don't have to answer this if you don't want to answer but how much was the build out roughly so the build out if i remember correctly because i want to say and you, you don't you don't have to give me an exact number just ballpark it. i'm just curious what they're what the finishes cost and everything right no i'm just trying to remember because i'm separating it from like the equipment cost and the other because we did an sba loan and so i have that number in my head but mm -hmm. a lot of that was like operating capital and stuff so i think for the actual build out um i think what we did was like it's like 165. that's not horrible it wasn't bad and now, now that doesn't include um since it was a new building our landlord gave us a really generous ti allowance and so like he covered you know portions of the construction but i think our final bill was around 165 or something like that yeah one thing i would caution people is you, some of these franchises cost four five six seven hundred thousand dollars to build out and yeah you, know, you do that that is an albatross around your neck that's just dragging you underwater yeah and it because when i worked at quiznos the initial build out was 450 to five hundred thousand dollars on these stores but then what would end up happening was that that guy could not make his rent and his his loan payment on the build out and so he would end up selling the store for like two hundred thousand bucks to somebody else right just to get out yeah and the two hundred thousand guy would also go bankrupt and then they would sell their store for about 50 and it was the guy who got it for 50 the third guy could actually make it work. He's making money yeah, a, because he didn't have because everybody else had lost their ass on the other 350k on that build out, right? And it was such a horrible thing to watch happen, but it happened all the time. Yeah. And uh, and so I just I just cash is king when you're starting a business, and anything you can do to conserve as much cash as possible uh, is key because of exactly what you said, which is everything takes longer than you expect it to take like when you're planning all this stuff out in your head you'll think okay i think it'll take eight weeks to get a building and then it takes seven months and you're like oh my god i burned through you know forty thousand dollars in that seven months just Wait. waiting just living doing nothing of pro you know like it's crazy how fast it goes oh man yeah i think I can't remember who said it that in business everything is twice takes twice as long and is twice as expensive as you expect and that's definitely yeah. true <laughs> yeah i don't know if it's exactly tw i'd say we were probably like three times as long and 1.5 times as expensive but the principle holds true it's yeah. like well and the human brain can't it can't think in such a detailed manner right that it can actually figure that stuff out accurately you know what i mean like it's just it's not possible because it has to start generalizing things so it can handle all of the details and so yeah right. just two months sounds about right and then you know all of a sudden seven months you're like what the hell you know and you don't rec you you can't recognize very quickly all of the little things that you didn't expect to happen hey that sinks in the wrong place well now we got to pay seventy five hundred dollars to move the pipe you know like it's oh dumb. Yeah amazing uh yeah well i mean that's one thing we're handling right now with our drive through that's why that's the only reason we haven't put in our drive through and done our grand opening yet is because um the menu boards we so dirty has a contract with the vendor that we work with to do all the menu boards and signage and stuff and uh the issue was they did i didn't know until we already had closed up the ground outside for the drive through that it needed a ground loop and so yeah. 
I, was, I asked my contractor, I was like, how much is going to be to tear that up? He's like, ah, uh, you don't want to do that. Yeah. He's like, you want to find another way to put that sign up. And so what we're doing is we're putting it, we're just mounting them straight to the wall. Um, sure. And we're going to just have, you know, a, a motion sensor. It'll tell you when someone pulls up and um, just take the order right there. We, we have really low wait times, so it shouldn't be an issue. But it was just like one of those things like, oh, my gosh, why didn't I think of that? Yeah. <laughs> Until after well, the- you, you don't know that because you're not a construction guy. And somebody probably should have told you, hey, <laughs> you're doing a drive through. You need electricity out there, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Because you don't think that because you just assume a lot of times that people are going to tell you everything you need to know and they either forget because they're not paying attention or they don't know or they or, think they already know. <laughs> yeah, they think they're you that they, they think that everybody knows this because their whole job is building dirty doughs. You've never built a dirty dough before, so you need that like extra help, right? To like get through all yeah. the little nuances. And because they don't have that many drive throughs, it's not top of mind. If every store had a drive through and dirty dough, then they would have told you instantaneously because they would be telling people every single day sure. that seven of them have it, right? Out of 60. So it's like less, you know, it's like what 10%, right? So it's not something they're thinking about, but they but they wouldn't have missed, hey, you gotta have a plug for ovens. Like they knew that, right? Because they need yeah. that. That's funny. Uh, well, Isaac, thank you so much for coming on, man. Absolutely. Um, it's been good. You want to plug where your dirty dough is and uh, let them know when you think you'll be grand opening. Go for it. Yeah, absolutely. So our dirty dough location is on South Campbell in Springfield, Missouri. It's 2515 South Campbell, Suite 100. So we're at the end cap right next to the La Quinta Hotel. Uh, we'll have the drive through open hopefully in the next couple weeks. And uh, we're looking toward a grand opening, hopefully on the 30th of August, just depending on when we can get that open and get the drive through running. But uh, we'll have a lot of fun stuff going on that day. If you want to follow us on Instagram, Dirty Dose Springfield, you can see all of our announcements and stuff. And uh, we'll see you there. Well, cool, man. Thanks for coming on the show today. Thank you guys for listening. And we'll be back with a new episode soon. Awesome. Thanks, Tommy. Oh, you're very welcome.